since the second half, really, how much they've really struggled. Find, set. Charged with finding some stability from this guy. By Bull and Bear Crew. Bull and Bear Crew is a range of men's skincare products. There is face moisturizers, face mist, body wash, beard wash, shave oil, and moisturizer. They come in a 100 ml pack, aluminium bottles. So they're safe for traveling. You can use them check in your baggage. Uh, they also come in larger at home bottles. All bottles are refillable, reusable, and recyclable. You can buy refill pouches to refill bottles you have at home if you don't want to purchase bottles from Bull and Bear Crew. Um, they've just been released. A great product, um, all natural, uh, all vegan, tested on men, not on animals, um, all that good stuff. Recyclable, reusable, and refillable. So you can use them over and over and over again. Go to their website, check them out, www bullandbearcrew.com uh, place your order at the moment they're only shipping within Australia um, but keep your ears and your eyes out to the website and uh, they may be able to extend the shipping at some point in the future um, please enjoy this episode there is like there's a lot of research around this about you know team teams forming and how it works and it follows a very mm. very predictable path there's this you know this forming stage then there's this storming stage where everyone's like, what the hell is this? Um, this is making me feel uncomfortable. There's a bit of pushback, um, but you just got to, you got to stay the course. Uh, and then there's a norming where it becomes, okay, are we peer reviewing today coaches? Are we doing it now? And then there's performing at the end where it's where everyone's just singing from the same song sheet and, and their goals are collective uh, and they know they're, they're not just one person there. They're, a member of a group of 15. Just a reminder that a great supporter of the show is Showcase Beers Cafe in Scarborough in Queensland. They're at Shop 6, 113 Landsborough Ave, Scarborough. They're open Wednesday to Friday, 5 p.m. till late. Saturday and Sunday, 12 p.m. till late. They have nine different independent craft beers on tap, but by the, by the time you listen to this, they've probably got 10 or 12 or 15 uh, beers because they're always expanding have the basic spirits and a small selection of wines fully functioning kitchen and you can get some awesome pizzas and nachos and they do four styles of chicken wings and many more and trust me i've been there the food is very good for pub food um, but the beers are sensational sunday afternoons they have an acoustic session from 3 p.m so if you're up in the area up around scarborough make sure you call in sit and have a nice cold beer and you can look out over the ocean. He can't find it. That's a mighty shot. A mighty Mark Lester. Mate, so let's make a start, Andy. So for the Sweet. people people that may not know who you are, um, just a quick, in a nutshell, um, who you are, where, you, where you're at, and mm. what's your involvements in the grassroots game? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my name's Andy Plymer. I live in uh, Montreal in Canada, and I am the host of the Rugby Coaches Corner podcast. Uh, that podcast has been running for almost seven years now. And basically, um, I started it up because um, I was seeking out professional development uh, online. Um, I was pretty pretty tired of relying on the, the national and provincial bodies to, to drive that kind of stuff. So, I was doing a lot of stuff uh, in the, independently, and yeah, I just saw a bit of a, a bit of a gap uh, in the podcast landscape uh, in 2015, where there was uh, there was only there was really essentially rugby chat shows. There wasn't there wasn't any rugby coaching uh, specific shows. So I uh, yeah, I went about it and recorded a bunch of interviews and launched in 2015, and uh, it's been you know 100 plus episodes uh, so far, and. It's been a great experience. It's, I've, I've talked to some coaches that, you know, I never thought I would have talked to, you know, like Eddie and Michael Checker and uh, Wayne Smith and Pierre Vilpero and, um, and then just talking to a bunch of grassroots people uh, to share experiences there. It's, it's, it's been, you know, really, really amazing. It's the best professional development I could have ever hoped for. Um, yeah, and now I'm in the process of uh, turning all those podcasts into an online course. 
So I spent, uh, you know, probably six months re-listening to a bunch of podcasts and taking out all the, the key points and putting them in themes. Uh, and those themes became chapters and I've recorded about half of the content now and I'm, I'm looking to release that uh, towards the end of the year. That's going to be called Evolve Rugby. Um, so, yeah, that's that's pretty fun. Uh, in terms of uh, grassroots involvement, um, <clears throat> pardon me, just been coaching, so I'm a bit croaky. Um I love the grassroots. I've, I've spent a bit of time in, in uh, age grade elite and I'm, I just find I'm way more comfortable in the grassroots environment. I, I, I love having a bit of fun, a uh, bit of banter with the guys and, and, you know, yeah, we want to win. We want to, we take ourselves seriously, but we also, you know, we're there for other, other aspects of, uh, of, you know, sport and friendships and those kind of things. So I love it. I'm uh I kind of, um, my role right now, I've got three kids, so I'm doing a lot of coaching with them. I want to coach them all the way through, um, really be involved in, in that uh, for as long as they'll, they'll have me. Um, so I'm really focusing more on, on that kind of setting. And with my club, the Montreal Irish, I, I'm, I now have a, like a coach development role there. So I'm helping, um, you know, junior coaches and, and senior coaches. Um, and that's kind of turned into um, the senior men, there was a void there that we needed. That's where I could have helped the most. So I kind of do one night a week uh, with the senior men. Um, I'll, I'm doing a lot of uh, team team building, team culture, um, trademark work, uh, peer review work with them, but also, um, you know, attack and backs, uh, backs play. Um, so that's loads of fun. And yeah, and, um, you know, so my week kind of looks like uh, Monday night is mini rugby, um, either with the U12s, U10s or U6s. Uh, my wife's also involved with the U6s there. Tuesday night is uh, senior club. Wednesday night, I coach my little guy in soccer. Uh, so I kind of have to, you know, get through that night. It's not my favorite sport. Um, <laughs> Thursday's the night off. Um, Friday night's family night, family movie night. And then Saturday, uh, if it's a home game, I'll, I'll go to that game. But if, if we're traveling, um, some of our away games are three hours away. So I'll... I'll I won't go to those, but I'll do video work afterwards and those kind of things. Yeah, so that's uh, that's where we're at. Nice. And at some point during that week, you do podcasts. Yeah, not not so <laughs> much lately, but yeah, I've got to, uh, I've got one lined up uh, in a couple of weeks. Oh, next week actually, and the week after. So yeah, I got to got to keep plugging away at that. I, I love doing it. Like it, it doesn't feel like a chore. So I'll keep doing it for as long as uh, I still feel that way. Um, so yeah, mm. yeah, I try and uh, try and get that done. And I've got to. Got a young guy who's um, he's uh, just graduated from journalism, so he's helping me out with the editing and a bit of the social media stuff and things like that. So that's really good to have. Yeah, uh, nice. The mighty Moritz, shout out to Moritz um, for helping out because that, like you know, the the editing, you know, well the whole thing really door to door is about four hours for me from yeah. setting it up to recording it to editing it to to posting it. So yeah, if you can lose a couple of hours out of that, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's the and three of those hours is not the fun stuff. Like, no. <laughs> there's an hour of the good yeah. stuff is having the chats yeah. and that stuff, but it's the other yeah. stuff, you know, editing it and mm. Yeah, mm. all that. And it, yeah. Anyway, we can chat about that as we go through. Um, yeah, I, I once had a mate of mine on the pod and he had hay fever uh, during the episode. And I think I cut out close to 100 sniffles uh, oh, between no. sentences. Yeah. That was the worst. Yeah, I've never forgiven him. <laughs> <laughs> My, the, the ones I because as you know you, you often talk to guys and they got really bad internet or connections and they just mm. drop out all the time and then yeah. you're trying to get you're trying to get the you know the continuity with what they've said before to the next mm. sometimes you just gotta go i gotta cut out a whole bit now it doesn't make yeah. sense and yeah all that all the joys of it but anyway yeah hopefully we'll be okay today um yeah yeah nice andy and i think if if I'm honest, yours is probably one of the first podcasts I listened to because I wasn't no, right, didn't, sweet. didn't know much about it. And then I started commuting a fair bit for work and one of my kids got me on the podcast and um, I thought, oh, well, and I just did the old rugby coach, you know, into yeah. thing, and, it, and it, I think yeah. yours and um, the Magic Academy ones came up. So yeah, so yeah. I got hooked on those pretty early and then it's expanded since then, but. Yeah, it's blown I've, up. I've, I've listened to most of yours, so really enjoy them. Oh, cool. Awesome. Um, Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem at all, mate. Um, so I know you're in Canada, but you're not originally from Canada. No. no. Um, uh, so 
what got you into coaching, especially in Canada? I uh, so I, I I grew up. I was born in Broken Hill, so not even nice. in rugby or rugby league territory. Um, so surrounded by Aussie rules. Uh, then mm. eventually made my way to Newcastle. A uh, few stops, uh, different stops with following uh, the old man's career. Um, so I, I started playing rugby league originally, and then switched over at university. And I did a phys ed degree at Newcastle Uni. Um, and then I, I, as soon as uni finished, I traveled overseas, did the backpacking thing for three years and then came back and played some grade rugby and, and things like that. And then got itchy feet again and ended up, uh, over in, uh, did a snowboarding season in Banff. And then, uh, I wanted to play rugby and wanted to play in BC, but they play a winter season. Uh, so somehow just ended up in Montreal with the Montreal Irish and, uh, just played that season, did a little bit of kind of back stuff, but not, not much. Uh, and that's where I met my wife. Uh, she was playing in the women's team. Uh, and then I went back to Australia and then we reconnected a couple of years later uh, and then decided uh, I was going to move over. And I never wanted to coach. Like I, I remember when I was in my twenties, I was like, this looks horrible. Why would you, why would you do this? So I never had any aspirations to coach even like towards, you know, the, my later twenties. And it just turned out that the club was gonna, gonna hook me up and help me out a little bit and wait till I got my, you know, all the paperwork and stuff sorted. And so it just seemed like a fun opportunity. I thought, oh, you know, I'll give it a crack for a year. And uh, that was 15 years ago. So it's uh, <laughs> it's kind of, it got its teeth into me early. And I think just being a phys ed teacher, it was kind of like a natural fit. Um, but yeah, I uh, I loved it early on and and I probably loved it a bit too much and I got too invested. And uh, I was probably chasing some of my own dreams as a, I was a player coach as well, which is very difficult. And I was probably chasing too many of my own dreams rather than connecting with the players and finding out actually what it, what do you guys want to do? Yeah. Um, so probably those first three years of coaching, I kind of the club was in the lower division, and I basically um, come hell or high water, <laughs> I skull drag them up to the top division, and uh, you know we we had some success. It was a means to an end though, and you know if I had my time again, I'd definitely do that a whole lot differently. But yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, initially it was I was a a coach who didn't really want to coach, but then I, I just got totally into it, and uh, yeah, I can't see myself not coaching really from like moving forward. Yeah, nice. That's a big big gap from Broken Hill to Montreal, so <laughs> yeah, a bit different. Yeah, especially the weather. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I've been to Broken Hill a couple of times, so yeah, mm. yeah no, that's a that's an interesting interesting journey, mate. Um, Thank you for that. No worries. So what's what's some of the heartbreaks or disappointments that you've had in that coaching journey? And and the reason I ask is because we've all had them as coaches. Yeah. And I think a lot of uh, young or inexperienced coaches in that first year or two years when they have those setbacks or the disappointments, they um, sort of go, oh, that's it, I'm not good enough. And they throw the toys out of the cot and they walk away. Yeah. And I think the difference is for most of us that have gone, well, that that was really horrible or that was bad, but took stuff away from it and learnt and grew from it are the guys that's, that stay in. So it's just more so mm, yeah. the, the young coaches can go, yeah, we're going to stuff up. We're going to get we're going to get stuff wrong. Everybody has. Um, so, yeah, have you Still got any? Do. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. So have you got a story nah, for or sure. something? Yeah, I kind of, I, I don't know, I'm the kind of, kind of coach I'll, I'll, especially after losses, I'll turn the mirror inwards and I'll, yeah. I'll be questioning, okay, what did I do wrong? Uh, not really looking, uh, sure, I'll look at video and we'll, we'll talk about it as a group of players, but I tend to look at, okay, what was wrong with my week or what was wrong with me on game day? Um, did, did I do anything? Um, yeah, we're probably disappointments. Um, sometimes those, those like I'm, I'm a, I was like this as a player and I'm like it as a coach where it's like, as soon as that whistle goes, I'm redlining. Like I'm right. Like just on that, I'm invested in the game heavily, but I can tip over uh, really, really quickly. Um, and, you know, I was like that as a player, especially in my later years as a player, um, when I became more senior and I was probably getting away for a bit more when I was a younger player around older guys, I'd just get told to shut up and I would. Um, 
but yeah, so I think some of those those long drives home from an away game where you've lost and you've lost your temper or cool on the sideline. Um, and you know, that's a, that's a tough drive home where you're gonna you gotta kick yourself and then you know the next kind of 24 hours is not not that fun either. So so they're they're the ones, those kind of disappointments. I, I work really hard to try and avoid those. Um, because I, I coach for fun. I don't I'm not coaching, yeah. I don't want a career in coaching. Um, I coach because I love it. Um, so I want to feel good, whether it's a win or a loss. Um, yeah, and then, you know, we're, we're here in Quebec, in, in Montreal, it's the province of Quebec. As far as rugby goes uh, for, for boys and men's, we're pretty low down on the totem pole. Uh, the women's 15s and 7s yeah. teams stacked with Quebec players. Um, but uh, in terms of men's rugby, uh, we're pretty low on the totem pole. And I, I've, I've been involved in, you know, some age grade rep stuff for Quebec and some regional stuff where, you know, we've had some good groups and we've had some really good players and, and you know, we've pushed. There was one, one tournament in Newfoundland where essentially British Columbia BC is, is, is the dominant team in age grade uh, rugby, closely followed by Ontario. Um, and we had one game against BC where we were, we were winning with five minutes to go. Uh, and, and I was already starting to feel a bit choked up that we we're going to beat BC. And then sure enough, we threw an intercept try and uh, we, we lost that game. Uh, so that was a pretty, pretty tough one to swallow. And then I suppose the last one um, kind of in that, in that theme is I get, I get really disappointed when I, when I see players who I'm coaching, who I know they can go to that next level in a, in a rep setting. So they might be in my U20 team or my uh, regional team and I'm pushing them to a national coach and they don't get selected. Um, that, that, that grinds my gears. I, I really, um, that bothers me a lot. And, you know, but on the other hand, sometimes I've had those stories where a guy hasn't been selected. Eric Howard was, uh, was one of those stories. He played for me uh, in the team called the Lower Canada Voyagers. Um, he came to the club, came to me as an eight. And I said, and man, the forwards coach said, buddy, I think you're going to be a hooker long-term. He said, yep, let's do it. Uh, he had an awesome tournament. Uh, he's about 5'8", five, 5'8 eight. Uh, five, eight by 5'8", five, full of muscle, like, you know, yeah. no body fat at all. And got didn't get selected uh, by the national U20 coach that year. Um, I kind of preempted it and said, look, you're going to be the small guy. They're going to tell you this. They're going to tell you that. Don't believe them. Um, fight back, push back. Um, remember it and keep working hard. And, you know, a few years down the track, he ended up being the national uh, senior men's hooker. So, you know, you, that's that's great for your your kind of you you feel that something's right with with a player and you they, they get the rewards at the end. But yeah, when they don't get it initially, that, that's a that's a disappointment for sure. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point, mate. That you know, I had a chat to a guy the other day, and some of those selections at that level are coach based, not necessarily player based. Yeah. Like they'll yeah, go with guys they know, or yeah. you know, sometimes you go, mate, that, that guy's the best guy for that role. But as mm. you know, there's all these other dynamics at that play. So I'm just just remembering that as well. So yeah, yeah. there's always there's always some political kind of undertones yeah. there that you've got to you've got to navigate. It's one thing I'm I'm not great at. It's probably the Aussie in me uh, <laughs> doesn't doesn't handle that stuff yeah. uh, with gentle gentle kid gloves kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it's it's at the end of the day you got to you're advocating for your players and you got to do it in the best ways you can to get them forward. And sometimes you've just got to eat it when when they don't get selected, but but support them. Yeah, yeah, continuously that's a, afterwards. That's, that's a good point, mate, because you obviously see something in them um, mm. and give them that support, and especially um, at that next as the higher up they get, the less numbers get picked. So they they might take two mm. hookers. You know, mm. So you're competing, you know, there might be 20 hookers there. They're only going to take two. Mm. So, yeah, but you yeah, keep supporting them. Um, and, yeah, hopefully they get there in the end. Well, they get to yeah. to be the best version of themselves anyway. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what about some great moments that, we, that, that you've had as a coach? Because, mate, let's be honest, the good moments outweigh the bad moments or we wouldn't, or we wouldn't keep doing it. Um, yeah, for sure. But some of the good moments that you've had that you just go, yeah, that's 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 why I keep doing what I do. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I would like, I'm I'm not a not one of those coaches who 
winning's not important. It's not important when you're coaching 12 year olds, but it is important when you're, you're yeah. coaching senior men or senior women. Um, so yeah, there's been some, we've like, basically when I arrived in 2003, it was the classic, uh, you know, drinking club with a rugby problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when I came back in 2007, it hadn't changed. So um, we, I worked really hard to get them to a point. And then I was off coaching other rep, but still being a player and doing a little bit of coaching with the club. And we, we got promoted in uh, one year and then the following year, uh, lost in the semis. And the following year after that, we won the premiership uh, for the first time in the club's history for 30 years, I think like that. And then we just went on a run and uh, I think we got six in 10 years or, or something along that. Our second grade team was awesome as well. Uh, and so just those, those, that first cup was pretty amazing. It was yeah. like, just, we were yeah. like, I look at those pictures too sometimes and it's like the, the group we had was just a ragtag kind of group, but, but we, we, we strung it together and, and got it, got it going. So that, that was definitely, um, definitely a highlight. Um, yeah. And just, just getting kids hooked on rugby, you know, like I, I've been a high school teacher here for 11 years. I've, I've just switched over to a college now, so I'm, I'm not coaching high school kids anymore. But I will, I will switch to high school girls when, uh, when my daughter gets to high school, which will be next year. Um, but just getting kids hooked on rugby, I, I love it. Like, uh, you know, you, you see a kid one week turn up, no clue, and then three weeks later they're wearing a rugby jersey and they've got shorts and they've got their, they got their boots and, you know, and you know, you're like, oh, they're a lifer. Like, they're in yeah. it for, for the long haul. So I love that. And I love, um, yeah, I love just seeing guys who I've coached and girls who I've coached do well um you know another another guy that i'll name drop is a bloke called matt heaton um he, he probably in southern hemisphere he was made famous in the last world cup against the all blacks canada versus the all blacks where he got a beautiful pop pass from one of his players he was going to score under the post and he dropped it cold on the on the try line um but i, I messaged him about that and he goes yeah, that's, that stuff happens we'll just get on with it and get get at it and He's just a guy who's just just such a hard worker and he was voted uh, Canadian national men's player uh, two years in a row. Um, and, you know, for, for a kid from a little, little country town in Quebec uh, to, to do that, it's, it's, it's awesome. And now he's, uh, he's captain of um, the Atlanta uh, team in the MLR. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, so he's, he's having a good crack at it and making a, making a real profession out of it and... Yeah, so I love seeing guys like that do well. You know, when when you've had a, a a small impact in 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 the journey. Yeah, no, and that's 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 good, mate. Because yeah, you see those kids, um, you know, and they do that, or you see the parents after a you know you take a rep team away, and one of the parents walks up to you and just mm. you know, oh, you you know, you don't know the difference that you've made, and so you, yeah, and you just walk away out. Yeah. That's why I keep doing what I do. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, yeah, it's a it's a people it's a people gig. Um, yeah, it's not as much as technical tactical is important. The, the the people that you're coaching is is the main thing, and having some kind of positive influence, whatever that can be, you can't have it on all. Like you're always going to have some, you yeah. know, some people walk away from your team going, yeah, wasn't a good fit, and that's fine. Um, yeah, but yeah, the, you you have a great opportunity to make big impacts. Mm. Yeah, and that's that's all a really good point, mate. Not everyone in the team's going to like you. Mm, yeah. It's usually the guys that are either a on the bench or didn't make this, you know, didn't make that first twenty three mm. or you know for, for whatever reason. And it, yeah, know, and that's something I think I struggled with for a long time was yeah knowing that guys in the team don't like. Oh, mate. but now it's like oh, well, that's I'm here to do what I do and I'm good at what I do and you know. That's fine. You can do it. Yeah. If you want to leave, that's fine. Go. But yeah, you know the guys that hang around are the guys that you get the buy-in from. So yeah, I think I think what you can do there the best thing you can do as a coach is to to make sure that you've covered all bases is is just constantly be communicating with people mm. uh, in terms of their status in the team and. Uh, you, you just can't drop someone if you haven't had a conversation with them. Yeah. Um, find out the find out the way they like to be communicated with about stuff like this, and 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 give them work ons and remove emotion from the conversation. And that's really all you can do. Um, you, you've got to be really clear in your values and your yeah. your standards, and 
and if you can walk back, talk back of those and, and point those out to them so they can have clear guidelines on why it hasn't gone the way they want it. Uh, yeah. that's, that's ideal. Obviously, I haven't done that very well in a bunch of times too. So, you know, it's a, it's a learn on the job forever kind of thing. Yeah, and I think the players forget that that's not an easy conversation for us either. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, it's just that, it's that confrontation and, you know, um, and I don't know, most, most players, if you tell them from, from my experience is, oh, you've been dropped to the bench. doesn't matter what you say after that. Mm. That's all, that's all they're going to, re- you know what I mean? So often I'll just go, yeah. this is what's happening. I'll talk to you in a day or two, you know, mm. and just, yeah. but like, so like you, just, you just got to know, the, you've just got to know the people. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, have those follow ups with them because, yeah, knowing them. And I think if you've got a good relationship with most of your players, they mm-hmm. know by the time you've had that conversation, they're going to go, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know why I'm on the bench, or yeah, yeah, or it's, or it's, you know, sometimes it's a mate, it's between you and him. We're giving him a crack mm-hmm. this week, we'll give you a crack. Yeah. And they go, yep, cool, because that they know it's coming from a good place. Yeah. yeah, some yeah. some of them aren't Good easy. Point. Some of them aren't easy yeah. conversations. Yeah. Um, so, because you do a lot of stuff in the youth and with, especially in the girls' space, um, so you potentially have got athletes that are gonna go on and be, you know, uh, follow that path into elite programs or whatever, and then you've got an athlete that turns up, like you said, first day, they got no idea, can't mm. catch a cold in the middle of winter, all this type of stuff. How do you keep your trainings so the player that is going to excel and the player that is, you know, first day, never played, just want to be there with my mm. mates? We've got to design a session so that the elite player keeps engaged, but also the, you don't want to lose that new player either. Yeah. Um, so what do you do in your sessions to try and cater um, for that range of players that you might have, um, especially at the youth level? It's, it's pretty difficult, I think. Yeah. Well, I think it's club level too. Like we're yeah, definitely okay. in Canada, the, the range of like skills and experience. It's, it's crazy. Uh, you, you'll get a lot of, guys coming to your club or girls coming to your club and it's they've never played rugby or they played like five years ago at high school for one season and you've, mm. you've got to fit them in um i probably and this go this is where the podcast has really helped me as a coach I, i'd probably you know call back to some of the some of the i i interviewed russell earnshaw twice so who you mentioned yep. the magic academy earlier on and uh he he was majorly influential on, on my coaching and in terms of how how I, i've always been somewhat games based uh from day one now i'm very games based um but what the games based stuff that i do differently now from talking to someone like russell earnshaw was what are you doing the game within the game he talks about and so you have that new player who can't yet who doesn't know to do skill x Mm. Okay, I'm going to go up to her and say, oh, okay, here's a challenge for you. I want you to try and pass off your left hand three times sometime in the next five minutes. And I'm going to give you a point every time you do it. And then for the elite player or the high level player, what's something that they need to work on? Okay, your kicking's not that great. If you can, I want you to try and set up a try, a kick to score try, uh, where you're doing a cross field kick to the winger uh, and you're trying to score. Or it might be a leadership thing. Notice, you know, you, 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 we, we need more out of you on that. You're our best player. I, I want I want to hear you speaking at every huddle that we do with with two really clear points on how we get better as a team. Um, so it's kind of, I suppose it's like a classroom as well. Like, you know, in a math classroom, you some kids are going to be doing different worksheets mm-hmm. to the other kids. Um, so trying to find out what, the, what they are and, you know, personalize it a little bit. Um, is where I'd lean to a lot and it's easier said than done, especially if you've got 20, 30 people that you're, yeah. and you're the only coach, which is, which is not uncommon in, in my landscape. Um, that, that, that is more difficult, but in those situations, that's when I'd lean really heavily on the players and, um, you know, give time uh, during the games to break. Okay. A minute. I want you to talk about this one thing and, 
You know, it might be, okay, new players only, you're only allowed to speak in, in this time. Let me hear what you're thinking about. And then next minute, okay, returning players help solve some problems that they've expressed or, or something like that. So I think I think using the players is one of your best one of your best tools. Um, I, I don't know everything and, you know, there's, there's players, I'm not seeing everything because I'm, I might be positioned in a different spot. And um, so, yeah, they, they'd be my, my kind of go-tos there. And, and just, of course, making it really, really heavily games-based that, you know, a large percentage, depending on what it is, of course, if it's, if it's attack for sure. Um, but if it's contact, we obviously have to adjust to that. Um, but they're not going to learn the game by, you know, running around cones or anything like yeah. that. They have to yeah. they have to play the game to learn it and then, yeah, personalise it within that. Yeah, nice. That's a good point, mate. I like that bit about the, giving them all different tasks during that game. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've done something similar, but just giving them all different... I think Russ, I think Rusty calls them superpowers. Yeah, exactly, um, yeah, yeah. And But I don't tell the other team what the other team's got. Mm-hmm. Not, you know, just... yeah throw things around and yeah. yeah and like you said sometimes it's difficult when you're the only coach there mm-hmm. uh, i'm lucky where i am at the moment we've got a couple of coaches but i have coached teams where i'm the only coach there and you've got you know that big spectrum of players and it can get quite difficult yeah, yeah. um feedback i know there's thousands of different things on feedback but what's your What's your preferred method around feedback to players um, as a group and individually, like during a session? Yeah, I. This is again. I'd probably lean on the players heavily. Um, I kind of like to talk as little as I have to, um, and I really. I went through university with the concept that uh, I only give them three teaching points. And now I'm like, that's, that's way too many. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like one, one might be good. Um, yeah. And uh, so I, I try and say as little as possible, um, you know, when, when needed. And I, I tend to, I tend to hover more. Like I'll explain the game. <clears throat> pardon me. I'll explain the game. We'll play the game. Then I'll stop. I'll ask, I'll do more, some questions, but like not just fluffy questions. Like I'll have a, I'll have a, like a real, point that i want to get out of the answers Mm -hmm. it'll be designed beforehand um and then be pulling information from the players in that regard uh and then we might return to the game with some new rules or or new adjustments to the field dimensions or or something like that Uh, or we might break and do do a drill that emphasizes what we want to do and then return to the game um but yeah a lot of that feedback would be coming from the players to the players um, and then I might be doing feedback on the run where yeah. I'll pull a player out and just have a, have a quick chat and say, what did you see there? What do you think you could do next time? If you had your time over again, how would you do it differently? Those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I think with the, with the technical, tactical stuff, if you're seeing something in general, maybe bring the team in and, and talk to the whole team. But I don't know how much value there is to that, really. Um, you, like, I remember... Um, talking to one podcast guest and uh he he said um the, the most attentive they are is at the 30 first 30 seconds of your session and then the next three minutes of the session uh set the tone um that's pretty frightening <laughs> when yeah. you think of it. so yeah. so you know not saying that the rest of the session is is useless but really like how much halfway through a session how, how much are they going to take in from you if you're if you're just like downloading everything about catch pass to them in 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 one chat um so that would that would be um that would be how i do it um another area that i really i love um is um like building that team culture and and creating having the players create some kind of identity uh some behaviors that link to that identity uh, and then they peer review each other on whether they're achieving those behaviors or not and living the the trademark that they've decided it would be. Um, so one of my favorite guests on my podcast was uh, Ray McLean. Uh, he's, he's the one who invented the, uh, the, the term leadership group. Um, he's worked a bunch across Aussie rules and uh, a bit of rugby, a bit of rugby league. Uh, runs a company called Leading Teams. Um, and um, 
he's his method is just fantastic and i was doing a bit of that tonight actually where i was introducing the group actually the first time they'd ever done a peer review session and that's really powerful that's feedback there again it's peer-to-peer you're more e- eavesdropping you might need to redirect the conversation or, yep. or 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 highlight a point that they're kind of missing mm-hmm. but really the feedback again is is from the players um it's it's intimidating. It it takes a, a, a bit of skill to get it right um, to create the environment that players feel safe to give honest feedback, and it takes time as well. Uh, the group has to grow uh, and be able to give hard honest feedback to a player um, takes time. It's yeah. difficult, and uh, yeah, the first one's always a little light and fluffy, but as it, as it goes, you can really really bring out things from players to another player like even a junior player or senior player that you one you probably never noticed yourself and two you probably were thinking oh shit i wouldn't say that uh if i was him but if you create the environment where they can give that feedback uh it's it's really powerful yeah no that's i have to go back and re-listen to that one again now mm. um yeah no that's he wrote, he wrote a great book um called in any given team it, it's about 15 15 years old now. Um, I think you can, you have to, you buy it off his website. Maybe I don't know, but if you type in any given team, uh, Ray McLean, uh, it's fantastic. It, yeah. it, it, it was one of those books that just changed my coaching uh, quite a while ago. And I, I'll, I'll use that, uh, that method with every team I coach. Yeah. I have to uh, look into that one. Um, I have, I've heard his name come up in a few different um, pods that I've listened to. So, no, that's really good, mate. And, yeah, that, like you said, some of it's interesting interesting to start with and watching it develop. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and peer-to-peer is always good if it's done if it's done right. Yeah. You know, and there's no ego yeah. in it. It's just, you know, peer-to-peer stuff. Yeah, and you've got to teach them how to do it so that it's meaningful. Yeah. Otherwise, it just becomes a whole lot of kind of back padding and hey, you're great at this and you're great at that, but okay, well, what's what's he actually need to work on? Yeah. Because um, otherwise, we're wasting everyone's time just just having this conversation. Or or um, it turn or it goes the other way and it just turns into a, a bitch fest and hundred you know, yeah. percent egos come out yeah. and we're not actually achieving anything either because then everyone yeah. just gets fired up and yeah yeah no you, yeah. You yeah. Should, Getting the exactly. balance that's, right. Yeah, and that's why the <clears throat> the concept of the trademark and the behaviours, it, it has to come from them. Mm. They have to collectively decide it. And then you're going to discuss how they collectively hold each other accountable to it. So it's, it's not top down at all. And it, it's all from them. And the, the build up, the peer review is the last part of the puzzle, last piece of the puzzle. Um, and everything is done by them and you're just leading it and, and guiding them. Yeah. So how, with that experience that you've had with that, what what sort of, like you see it develop over time? Is that a couple of weeks, a couple of sessions, mm. longer? Yeah. It just dep- or it just depends a, on the team. It, it depends on the group. I, I find um, the group I'm working with now, um, so I, I was head coach of the Irish in 2018. Uh, and then I... Um, I uh, was coaching uh, with a women's university team for three years and, and plus COVID and all that stuff. Um, and now I'm back with the group. So there's, there's actually, there's probably 10 or 12 members of, of the two teams that was in the, were in the group in 2018. So, so they've gone through this process already. Yeah. So I would, I put them tonight in, well, I, I had them peer reviewing in groups of five and I made sure in each one of those groups of five, there was a previous player who's already gone through this process. Uh, so with that group, with, with some mature kind of experienced players in that group, it's kind of pushing along quicker than maybe a, a first time group. If I just rocked up at yeah. a new club and they've never heard anything about this and they don't even know me. Um, but there is like, there's a lot of research around this about, you know, team, teams forming and how it works and it follows a very mm. very predictable path there's this you know this forming stage then there's this storming stage where everyone's like what the hell is this um this is making me feel uncomfortable there's a bit of pushback um but you just gotta you gotta stay the course 
Uh, and then there's a norming where it becomes, okay, are we peer reviewing today, coaches? Are we doing it now? And then there's performing at the end where it's where everyone's just singing from the same song sheet and and their goals are collective uh, and they know they're, they're not just one person there. They're a member of a group of 15. Um, so, yeah, the timeline's different with different groups, but... Yeah. I love it when you get when once you get past that storming stage because that storming stage you do you have some uncomfortable conversations you have yep. to otherwise yep. it'll die, um, but when you get into that norming performing stage it's epic. Uh, yeah, nice. You're 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 rocking up to practice and it's like ten seconds. Okay, boys, peer review. I want you to focus on these five behaviors. Go, and boom, they're off. Five minutes later, everyone comes back all switched on, ready to go. Um, everyone's ready to get stuck in so um yeah i can't i can't talk more highly about about that process uh it's 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 pretty awesome yeah so would you have the same groups peer reviewing every week or do you move move the players yeah. around um what yeah. does that sort of look like for you it, it kind of this is and that's the fun part right you can you can get super creative with it um yeah. again depends on the group depends on you know the age and those kind of things um I've, I've done it where it's like, you know, 9, 10, 12, 13, you know, the, the smaller subunits. Yep. Then it might be forwards, backs. Uh, I've done it whole team. I've done it um, like a speed dating version yep. where it was a, two circles of 10 and every minute you move one uh, and you get a positive and a work on uh, from, from each person. That one was a really good one. Uh, that was with a U19 team. We were away on a, on a tournament and basically you watched – you, if you watch one one kid pretty much get peer reviewed by you know 10 others nine eight or nine of those feedback are exactly the same yeah. and so that kid's been told by nine other people or eight other people that one thing he does is affecting the team and that one thing he does is really benefiting the team and super positive to the team um, so there's no there's no gray area there it's, mm. it's very clear that okay i need to fix that um and that's one of the one of the rules of peer review is that you're not allowed to justify. So if you get a peer review saying, yeah. "Hey, you know, you you lost you lost your cool, uh, it cost us two penalties on the weekend. Um, those two penalties resulted in points. That's affecting the team. That can't happen again. And if you if you then turn around and say, "Yeah, but the ref ref was garbage," like you're justifying that behaviour and you're guaranteeing yeah. that that behaviour is going to be repeated uh, when you're under the pump. Uh, in future future time so yeah you can get super creative um often if i find the group's a bit nervous about the whole whole process i'll do it the first one i'll do it where it's like they'll write it on a bit of paper and they'll put it in a bucket and they'll write the name and the peer review and then i'll vet it and go through it and then i'll i'll filter it out that way just to introduce them to it yeah, yeah. there's a there's 101 different ways you can yeah. do it nice i I like the speed dating one. I've seen something similar yeah. done. Um, not quite like that, but something very similar. Um, but I like that. Oh, you said, yeah, they're going to get this pretty much the same feedback mm. from, from the rest of the team. And especially if it's the little things, you know, yeah. the, the things that other, you know, people on the sideline might not notice. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. the guy goes, oh, okay, yeah, I, I impacted. Well, the coach that. doesn't even notice. Yeah, you know? yeah, like, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it's really powerful. Yeah. I think in the early stages, they will tend to lean on when it comes to. So, one of my rules is if you give a positive, you've got to give a work on. Yeah. If you give two positives, you've got to give two work on. So, no one's, no one's walking yeah. away with a big head and no one's walking away having their soul crushed. Um, so, it's got to be balanced. It's got to be evened out. Um, and so, what I've found in those early stages is the work on always is a technical or a tactical thing. Like you've yeah. got to be better at your pass. You've got to be better at your kick or whatever, because that's, that's an easy one. That's a safe one, but very rarely are those early ones. Hey, you know what? You said something in practice to, um, you know, the other player last night. Well, I found that pretty, pretty disappointing. And I don't think you should speak to people like that. Um, that, that, <laughs> that won't come out in that first peer review mm. session, but yeah. it might come out in the fifth peer review session. Yeah. Um, if, if you are consistent and do it on a week by week basis. Yeah. Yeah. Cause then they've got that not confidence in each other, but they know that, mm. like you said, there's, there's no egos, there's no justification. It's all just, 
what we're seeing, what we're doing, how do we improve? Yeah. Yeah. And they're now in that norming stage, right? Yeah. So they're not, yeah. they're not at that stage where it's like, oh, what podcast does the coach listen to now? Yeah. Um, what, who, but when they see it's happening every week, every week, every week, okay, this is what we're doing. Mm. Um, and, mm. and, you know, they get more comfortable. Yeah. No, that's awesome, mate. That's, uh, cool. that's really good. Uh, uh, where are we? Where are we? Done that. Done that. Um, coach, uh, let's, some of the lessons that you've learned over the, the 15 years or so that you've been coaching, um, especially, um, and I've had a few other guests on that are in non-traditional rugby areas. Mm-hmm. Um, and they tend to have different lessons than, you know, the guys that coach in Sydney, Brisbane, the UK, where you've mm-hmm. got that rugby community. Um, so for the listeners that are in those non-rugby areas or, or, or for any coaches, what's some of the lessons that you've learned, um, like being in Canada and coaching that you could share? Probably, um, well, some of the rep stuff that I've done, I, I probably went in, especially like uh, when I was involved with the Canada U17 set up for, I think it was like four or five years. I think in the first year I went there thinking, these kids are going to be really good rugby players. And they're, they're good athletes, don't get me wrong. But then you get there and you're like, oh my goodness, the fly half doesn't know how to kick. <laughs> so so making assumptions uh, about where you think the players will be at before you get there. Um, that kind of, I went in with all these ideas on what I was actually going to be doing, but then I, I don't know if I even adjusted. Maybe I didn't in that first, those first couple of times. Uh, where I realized, oh, okay, so yes, he's playing representative rugby, but um, he's probably only been playing rugby for two years or three years. So um, I wasn't really meeting them where they were at. Um, I think that would be an important one. You're, you're going to get uh, a lot of general generalists coming into yeah. rugby, especially when you, when you coach at the high school level. Um, you'll get a lot of kids come over. And I think knowing... It took me a while to know which ones would would adjust to rugby really well. I always coming over, I thought, ah, the football kids, they're gonna smash it. Like they're gonna love it. They're gonna really enjoy it. Uh, they're probably the, some of the hardest that I've that I've tried to yeah, right, tried okay. to develop as rugby players. And it's basically well, they go whistle to whistle. So they start, they stop, they start, they stop. Yeah. So they get murdered when it comes to a quick tap. Um, mm. It takes you an entire high school season to get them to realize what a quick tap is and no, you don't get to stop. You don't get to turn around and walk away. Um, so that's a big one. But then a lot of the football guys have just been so overcoached in terms of what they can and can't do. Uh, they're always asking permission. Um, they might've gone through a, a high school football um, in inverted commas career um, doing one thing, uh, running one one route or whatever it is, they may not have even touched the football, even though the, the sport's called football. Um, so I've found those, a lot of the, some of them, obviously, this is a big generalization. Some of them were, were fantastic, um, but I found some of the ones were, were pretty wooden and and tricky to, to, to adapt into rugby. Um, kids who played soccer, kids who played basketball, fantastic they they really understand space uh width and depth even though it's you know you're just doing backwards passing um they they transfer really well and obviously the wrestling kids uh, are really good in in the contact area and and don't don't shy away from that that yeah. kind of thing so learning that um if i learned that a little bit earlier on uh would have would have helped um and then i think um I think I did, you know, probably all coaches do this, but I, I did the, we're going to structure everything on every, every part of the field. We're going to know exactly what we're, we're doing. And now I'm, I'm pretty much the opposite. Yeah. I'm like full 1980s, 1990s French, where it's, you know, you play what you're seeing and you as a ball carrier, your objective is to, you know, move the defender and open up space and look to look to get an offload first before going to the ground and setting up a ruck second. Um, so, yeah, I just, I suppose, you know, my, my playing philosophy wasn't, wasn't that clear. Um, and then, yeah, probably the last thing is just like, 
just chill out. <laughs> yeah. don't, uh, don't, 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 don't take it so seriously. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to have standards of course, but you can't, you can't be, you know, uh, I had one guest on Dave Morrow, he's ex, uh, ex military, mm. uh, did a tour of Afghanistan for the Canadian army. And he, he calls it loudership instead of leadership. And, you know, anyone can shout, but that's, doesn't take much talent to do mm, that, but mm. to actually lead and to, to get people to play for each other um, and for you, because they, they do play for you. Um, that's a skill. Um, so if you, if you're always, if you don't seem like you're a good bloke, um, it's, it's going to, yeah. it's going to be hard for them to play for you. So yeah, just the more I coach, the more chilled out I am uh, about, about those kind of things with, with the boys. Yeah. And that's, that's a really good point about trying to stay chilled on the sideline um, and a lot of coaches I've spoken to. And again, like I probably wasn't when I first started, but I'm a lot more chilled now because mm. I can't remember who it was or what podcast it was I was listening to. And this coach just said, when those players are under stress and they look to the sideline and they look at me mm. losing my shit, what mm. does that tell the players? Yeah, and I went, yeah. So if they can look across and you're calm and you're making, mm. you know, good comms to them, rash decisions, they're going to go, hang on, the coach trusts us, he believes in us. That might be the difference between them, you know, mm. falling apart. Um, yeah, so I, I try and most, and my boys down now, if I twist off, they go, oh, hang on. It's, mm. you know, and it just say it for special occasions i suppose yeah, um, yeah. But it's usually at training it's not really at a game because game day you mm. can't you can't change anything on game day yeah i'm still learning that <laughs> <laughs> i've uh, yeah i was talking more at training um mm. being chilled but yeah it's it's a challenge that's going to follow me my whole coaching career it's just yeah. like i i invest in the game and and it's a slippery slope and so um you know I, it's a constant work on for me. I, I kind of do, um, the last few games I've gone to the whole blue head, red head, yeah. um, chat that the, that the all blacks were doing for a while. And, you know, when I feel myself getting into that red head, I just do two, two claps yeah. and, um, that's my, that's my trigger to try and pull me away from that uh, yeah. red head. I'll walk away. I'll have a drink of water. Um, I do a lot of my coaching in the in goal too. Yep. Um, I haven't done a lot of that this season, so it's definitely something that I need to explore. Um, and I actually started doing a lot of my coaching with a two-way radio as well, mm. which wasn't a, I know that's you know probably pretty common uh, you know, in Oz, but here it was like not really a thing, but uh, I found that a really good, good way to kind of just go and disappear and whoever's on the sideline is managing subs and warming them up and doing changes and those kind of things. So yeah, yeah. it's, and it's I tend, a challenge for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, I sort of float between the two either in the, on the bench or behind the goals, depending on mm. um, like the other week we had a couple of coaches crook. So, and so I had to be in the box and it was just mm. like, I just missed so much of the game. Oh, I love the box. <laughs> Put me I, in the box oh, every day. No, I, I, I don't know. Because I, I find that, not that I get distracted, but, you know, I've got people asking me, oh, what, you know, all this stuff. And then you've got people, you know, just outside making comments. Mm. Just like, if I get down behind the post, I can just watch what's mm. going on. Um, and, yeah, yeah I, I know coaches that just go, yeah, I just like my space here. Mm. Um, but I, I, I prefer behind the post. Um, yeah, it's funny though, eh? Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, their, and again, it's that preference, preference around it. Um, and I think one, I had to go down one day. Um, the manager was struggling just with everything that was going on because one of the other guys was mm. away and I was just like, yeah, I've got to go down and give him a hand. And then I was more focused on the subs and getting them warmed up and not, and the other coaches going, yeah. let's go, okay, mate, I, I don't know. I'm trying to, you know, organize this and injuries, <laughs> speak to the physio. Oh yeah. So. No, I was just about to say that I um last weekend I was like I'm gonna run the water. That's what that's what I'm gonna do. Like I'm not the head coach, so yeah, I'm um happy to run the water and take out one point to one player yep. uh, or a general theme to the group. And I loved it. I found yeah. that was that was I've I've done that um a few years ago, uh, 2017 when I, again I was the assistant coach. 
Um, and that kind of what you're saying, you know, keeps me busy. I'm filling up water jugs and, you know, organizing guys to help fill up water jugs and I'm taking notes on the game. I'm not that invested. I wasn't that, didn't feel that invested in the decisions mm. that the referees were making essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, it's just that personal preference. So mm. no, that's awesome, mate. Um, coach development. I think we've spoken about um, pretty much all the way through. What's the development path like in Canada for you guys? Um, <laughs> is there one? Is there not the, one? Yeah, it's a um, rhetorical question. Uh, yeah. um, it's uh, it's difficult. It really is. It took me it took me longer to get my level three than it did to get my university degree. Yeah. Um, which is which is crazy. Um, I kind of got caught up in a, and a lot of this was out of people's control. Um, I got caught up with um world rugby stuff being mandated by the Canadian government to be aligned with uh, their own sporting uh, body. So every sport in Canada had to be aligned with the national national coaching yeah, well. certification program. So I was all ready to do the level three and then that came in and then I became part of a pilot program that became never ending. Um, and eventually I got my level three. Um, so it was a... In terms of professional development, it was a, a very frustrating experience. I didn't feel I got um, a lot out of the, as much as I could have out of it. Mm -hmm. Now that's that's changed a lot. Um, they've now got it, you know, similar to what you'd have in Australia, where it's a, a a group of you know, let's say twenty coaches, and they they go on a one year journey um, to 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 get their level three, and they're either awarded it or they're not. Um, so that so that's a lot better. Um, I honestly, I think, I, I don't, it, you know, I don't think it should be up to uh, the national bodies or provincial bodies to, to be the sole source of professional development. Mm -hmm. I think it's on the coach. Uh, and especially now, like it's, yeah. it's crazy what, what information you can get uh, for free. Um, so whether it be, you know, online books, podcasts, uh, YouTube videos, obviously you've got to have a filter and you've got to make sure that it fits for your group and for your, your context. Um, but you, coaches should be developing themselves ongoing um, independently and, you know, create a WhatsApp group with a bunch of coaches, like-minded yeah. coaches and bounce things off, even if they're opponents, you know, yeah. um, go and coach <laughs> in other environments, other sports, uh, lo loads of opportunities to, to get better as a coach and, you know, how, how, how good are we at reflection? You know, I'd, I'd argue not very, nah, um, terrible. I think probably, the, probably the year, the best year I coached, uh, was in, in 2017 and 2018. And I religiously set a memo in my phone, um, reflect on your session. And then I'd set a memo in my phone, uh, read the reflection before you plan. And so I was in this week by week reflection, uh, planning process and, you know, like that that that's coach development right there um yeah it doesn't have to be formal it doesn't have to be in a classroom with you know one person downloading all all the knowledge mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. onto you uh there's there's loads of opportunities we're, we're spoiled yeah and and yeah i'll probably just the last bit and you probably get this as well um man just reach out to a coach yeah. like if you're a coach and you you don't know and you're like oh shit jim mckay is an awesome attack coach I wonder if he talked to me about this yeah. I don't know. yeah he maybe or maybe he's too busy but he'll never know about you unless you send him a message or, or whatever the case may be so yeah um, the amount of guys that say and, and girls that say yes to to coming on the podcast to have a an hour chat with someone they've never heard of um more say that more say yes than no for sure yeah and you're dead right and i think that COVID lockdown period for me showed that mm. there was all these coaches sitting around not coaching, but they yeah. wanted to keep their brains active. So it was like, Oh, who yeah. can I talk to? Who can I? And like you said, you, you just reach out to people and everyone I've asked to come on the podcast has said, yeah, cool. No problem. Mm. Um, mm. Obviously we, you know, we got schedules and, you know, and that's, that's, you know, it is what it is when people are generous to give up their time, you, you, you work around it. Um, mm. but even the coaches, you reach out to them and 95% of them will go, yep. And usually the 5% that 
especially at that elite level, if they don't, they'll go, I can't at the moment because I've got exactly this yeah. on or that on. Or yeah. talk talk to this guy, tell him I told you to give him a call. You know, they, mm. they don't just go, no, piss off. It'll yeah. be like, yeah. or can you call me after, you know, this date because we've got this going on. So yeah. you're right, just reach out. And what's the worst that's going to happen? You're not going to get yeah. you're not going to get it from that guy. So ask someone else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they don't respond. Oh well. Yeah, they, yeah. Well, yeah. I've lost nothing. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, someone exactly. Else. exactly. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. No, that's really good, mate. Um, last bit. Well, before we go, um, if you could go back to that first se- season that you were coaching, um, what advice would you give yourself knowing what you know now? <laughs> I think I've already said it. Um, just chill out. Like <laughs> I was, I was like I came off a bad, like a bad experience um from from like playing uh in australia and that really that really affected me my the following season so I, i'd essentially been playing first grade for a club for for a couple of years and uh i was easily the 16th best player in that first grade group but somehow yeah. i kept managed to get him picked in first grade uh and then you know the inevitable happened and i got dropped uh just before the semi-finals um we didn't, I didn't get on in the semifinals. I played second grade uh, and then second grade lost. I uh, didn't get on in the first grade uh, semifinal. Uh, and then we won that and we went to the grand final and I sat on the bench, didn't get on for that. And it was the first time the club had won for like 20 years or 30 years. So it was pretty huge and pretty awesome. And I was pretty shit. I handled it so poorly. Yeah. Um, and it was just a big, like it took a while for the learning to kind of kick in. Um, but I, the following season was my first year coaching as a player coach who'd never coached rugby before. Um, so I went in, I went into that season thinking where well, I'm winning, I'm winning a championship because I didn't, I, I didn't get it last year. Yeah. And uh, it, it was just the wrong motivation <laughs> to go to a group of players. So thankfully a bunch of those players are still my friends um, and we, we still have beers and they still take the piss out of me. Um, but yeah, I just, I, you know, you've, it, it goes to what, what, what's your, what's your motivations as a coach? What's your philosophy as a coach? Why, why are you doing it? Cause if you're doing it for personal, uh, personal gains and personal achievements, you're gonna, you, it's gonna, you're gonna hit a brick wall uh, mm. pretty soon. It's not gonna be fun for you, not fun for the players. Um, so yeah, that would be my thing. Would be you know, you know, just chill out a bit. Realize that these guys are coming from a shit day at work, yeah. and now they're having two hours of shit with you. <laughs> yeah. So make it make it two awesome hours instead of two terrible hours. Yeah. Um, and I'm probably I'm probably doing myself a disservice here. Though it was, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a total horror show, but there was definitely some times where I just like these guys just want to play footy and have fun and have a couple of beers afterwards. So yeah, that would be it. It would have been a much more enjoyable ride, but then at the same time, I also think we've got to make these mistakes too. If you, if you, if you're reflective enough and you, you, you can look at yourself honestly and and feel those gut feelings and go, oof, I don't want to feel that again. Like yeah. how do you grow? So yeah. yeah. Nice. Mm. Yeah. That's no, really good, mate. That's awesome. Mate, thanks so much for your time. Um, we, had, we had to reschedule a couple of times because of... Yeah, that was all on me. <laughs> oh, mate, no, it's all good. It's, um, the, the time differences and... Yeah, you know, it's is, tough. It, mate, as you know, it, it, trying to get people on is lining everything up. And like we said, mate, sometimes you just, you know, people are giving you time for free. So sometimes you, yeah. you got to make um, you got to make it work. So Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But no, thanks very much, Andy. That was... Uh, Awesome, mate. And I, I've got quite a few notes here, so hopefully the listeners have taken um, a few things out of this. And I'm definitely going to go back and re-listen to that Ray McLean one. Um, yeah, and we'll go from there. Yeah, mate. Thank yeah, and you if so- anyone wants ever wants to reach out, they can hit me up on on yeah. Twitter. Yeah, and I'll put uh, I'll put all your on. I'll put all your um, contacts in the show notes as well, mate. So yeah, if anyone sure. anyone wants to reach out, um, yeah, happy to. Mate, thanks for your time. Pleasure. Cheers, bully. Thanks, Appreciate mate. You reaching out. No Thanks, worries. mate. Thanks, buddy. See you later.
13 